In this lecture, we're going to be looking um, a little bit more in depth into the factor market. And remember, the factor market is going on all the time, um, while the product market is also going on, as we learned yesterday, as we talked about the circular flow. And there are different levels of competitiveness and competition in various factor markets. You know, in the in the product markets, we studied how there's perfect competition or monopolistic competition or oligopoly or monopoly. And there are similar things going on in factor markets as well. Um, some factor markets only have one, one buyer. Others have several. And we're not going to get too in detail in this in this course about the, the different lov levels of competition in factor markets. But we're just going to take a look at a very simple question. And that is, how do businesses determine the number of factors to purchase. So just a quick review, the factors of production are land, which are, are natural resources, labor, which is you know the human input, capital, and we have both physical and human capital as kind of subcategories of the machinery, equipment, and tools that are used. And then the entrepreneur is um, the person that combines the land, labor, and capital to create goods and services. So as we're talking about the factors in factor markets, we're talking about anything that would fit into these categories. So factors are productive and earn income repeatedly. So you can keep using them again and again to keep producing, whereas inputs are used up in the production process. So inputs would be like materials that you use when you're manufacturing, but you run out of them. Factors you can keep using again and again. And factor prices are what determine production. So we did learn a little bit about production and the law of diminishing marginal returns earlier in the course. And so some of this that we're going to be going over right now is review, because you have already learned how to do these calculations and you know what these things mean. But we're just going to take it one step farther today. So the example that we'll be using is Jolene's Driving School. And you can see in the table here that total product is listed. So this table tells us how many lessons can be taught depending on the number of instructors that are on staff. And so total product is the amount of output that can be produced as one input changes. So in total, when there are five workers at Jolene's Driving School, they can do 30 lessons. We'll say this is per week. And the, the question that we hope to answer by the end of this is, how many instructors are enough? Or what's the optimal number of instructors for Jolene to hire at her driving school? So that's kind of where we're headed. All right, this is also review the marginal product. Or since we're talking about labor, we can be more specific and say marginal product of labor is the additional output per input. So every time we add another worker to our total, how many more lessons do they help us produce? And so that's calculated here in the right hand column, the marginal product or marginal product of labor, because we're talking about how marginal product, the marginal product per additional laborer in this circumstance. But we learned this before, just called it marginal product, it's the same thing. So here's the marginal product of labor when we add one more laborer at Jolene's driving school. Um, so, when we have one worker instead of zero workers, they can produce eight lessons instead of zero lessons. So the marginal product, the additional output, is eight lessons when we add the first worker. When we add the second worker, the additional output is seven. They can add seven to total output because eight plus seven is fifteen. So, again, we, we already know how to calculate. So this is where we're, we're doing something new and where we're adding something new to what we've already learned. Um, while it's really exciting to know how many more lessons each worker can add to total output, which is the marginal product of labor, that doesn't really help us answer the question, how many workers should we hire? Because we need to know how much money we're going to make with each of those additional workers that we hire. So the first thing we need to know is how much can we sell those lessons for that each worker adds to total output. So the value of the marginal product of labor is the value in money terms of the additional output per input. So when we add another worker, how much more 
are they actually going to earn for our company? And if each lesson sells for $35, then the way that we would calculate the value of the marginal product of labor is taking the marginal product of labor at each, for each worker and multiplying it by 35 since you can sell each of those lessons for $35 a piece. Okay, so this is a lot of complicated um, lingo, but all this really means here, the VMPL, the value of the marginal product of labor, tells us how much money each of these workers is going to add to um, our, our record books as, as we hire these workers. So this first instructor helps us produce eight additional lessons which we can sell for $35 a piece. So this first worker is bringing in an additional $280 when we hire that worker. The second worker can help us increase the number of lessons we teach by seven. So the marginal product labor is seven for the second worker multiplied by $35 since that's what we can get for each lesson and it's $245. So again, the value of the marginal product of labor tells us in money terms how much does each additional worker or driving instructor in this particular situation um, add to our income as a company. Now knowing that, we, um, we can start to get towards our answer here. If each driving instructor gets paid $160 per week, and this, all this information is per week. How many instructors should be hired? Now to answer this question, we're going to have to use marginal analysis. And again, the optimal um, answer is when marginal benefits equal marginal costs. And if they can't be exactly equal, uh, we would want the benefits to be a little bit greater. So in this example, the value of the marginal product of labor is the marginal benefit, the amount of money that another worker is bringing in for us and the wage is the marginal cost the amount of money that we have to pay that additional worker that we hire so it's optimal when the VMPL equals the wage rate and if they're not going to be equal then we would want the VMPL to be a little bit greater so looking at our table here if the wage rate is $160 um, it would be smart to hire the first worker because we pay them 160 and they bring in an additional 280. It would be smart to hire the second worker because we only have to pay them 160 and they're bringing in 245 for us. The third worker would again be smart to hire, paying them 160, they're bringing in 210 for the company. Good choice. Fourth worker, same deal, they're bringing in 175 for the company and we only pay them 160. So again, we're still coming out ahead of the deal by $15 by hiring this fourth worker. But when we get to the fifth worker, we would have to pay that person $160 and they're only bringing in $140 for the company. So this fifth worker would not be hired. We would stop at four. So in this situation, it's not a perfect um, world example where the VMPL exactly equals the wage rate, but four workers is our best case scenario before we um, violate the rule and go on to five where the marginal costs are greater than the marginal benefits. When you do your problem set, you're going to be asked to graph the VMPL, and this is how you will want to set that graph up. This is just another way of analyzing the same information but looking at it graphically instead of in a table. And the way you'll set the graph up is um, wages will go on the vertical axis and the quantity of labor will go on the horizontal axis. Make sure you make a note of this for yourself so you make your graph right. And you're just going to graph the VMPL for each worker. And then depending on the wage rate, which in this situation is $160, you're just going to draw a line across at $160 to see where it intersects with the VMPL. And we can see that it's at like 4.2 workers or something like that, but you know we'd backtrack to 4 rather than go on to 5. So the answer here would be 4. And so there will be a, a similar application of this using this graph when you do your problem set. So that is the end. That brings us to the end of the notes. Um, again, we're just taking this idea of studying the inputs and, and thinking about um, the law of diminishing marginal returns and, and um, taking it one step further to figure out how many workers should be hired by multiplying the marginal product of labor by the selling price of the product and then figuring out where that's equal to the wage rate of the input.
and that's your optimal number of inputs.